Louise Milligan, congratulations. Thank this you, is so Pamela. exciting. I, um, I feel very lucky and grateful to be launching this book. I've got an admission to make. I didn't necessarily think that I was the target audience for such a book. And that's not because of crime or thrillers. I think I'm just a wuss. But I was so completely taken in by this novel that you've got. Um, I think one of the other barriers for maybe me and other readers is um, the genre can sometimes uh, set up tropes about men and women, and I feel like I can't wait to talk to you about how you upend those tropes. But first of all, I mean, we know you, as Dan was saying, for your journalism and your investigations, but here you're doing something completely new with fiction. Why the novel and why now? Um, I, can, is this working? No, it's not. I don't it's think not. it is. Is that working? Yes, yes. Okay, um, so, I mean, I actually started writing this quite a long time ago, um, back in 2015, and I had just covered the Jill Ma case, um, the Irish-Australian woman who was murdered in Melbourne and I was the first person to interview her husband Tom who was a really really lovely person and I was really affected mm. by covering that case and at the time I was sort of I, I used to drive up and down the Hume Highway quite a lot and or freeway as it now is and um uh, not that long after that, I was uh, on it, during one of the summers, like I think between two, 2014 and 15, I was driving up the Hume and I had also been working on a bunch of stories about police with post-traumatic stress disorder and many, many years before that, um, back in the early 2000s, I had covered a coronial inquest about... Um, a, a, a young man who had thrown himself off the Pheasant's mm. Nest Bridge. And I'd always found that stretch of country very sort of Australian Gothic. And I found out more that, you know, this was a place where a lot of people had lost their lives, you know, many of them because they jumped off. Mm. And when I was covering this inquest, the inquest itself was one thing, but the thing that really struck me was the police, the local mm. police who had this terrible PTSD toll because they had had to collect the bodies or try and stop the people from jumping. And I had written a story for The Australian where I was then working and um, I, the story, I can't remember exactly what happened but it was spiked because of suicide. So at the time we had very strict reporting guidelines for suicide and those police and their experience had always stayed with me. And then fast forward a few years, I did this work for seven, ABC TV 730 program with a lot of police. Mm. And um, one of them is here tonight, Peter. Um, and I was so moved again by their experience. And I thought, what if someone like Jill Ma, but not mm. Jill Ma, mm survived mm. the initial horrible crime and what if she was a journalist mm. and what if she could reflect on her experience and what if the victim was the center of the crime instead of being an object to the yeah. side instead of being you know Laura Palmer wrapped in plastic yeah and I wanted to give her a voice but I also wanted to give the police a different voice, like to give them a sense of um, uh, complexity and humanity because I had seen that in so many of them over so many years. Anyway, wrote three chapters in mm. 2015 and then the small matter of the Royal Commission into Institutional Responses to Child Sexual Abuse came along and I got very, very distracted by that. And that led to my first book, Cardinal, mm. and my second book, uh, Witness. And then, you know, the other small matter of the um, Attorney General, former Attorney General came along and, you know, anyway, seven years passed. 
And I got to the point after that where it was a dark time. Like, I'm not going to lie. I had been wading through misery for many years. I had a lot of secondary trauma um, and I was needing to do something and I didn't know quite what it was. And I was say, joking with people say, I'm going to write the great Australian novel. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, I'm going to go back to that pheasant's nest. And I did. And I thought, actually, I think this is worth going with. Wow. What a backstory. What I <laughs> hear, lot. No, what I hear there. Yeah, absolutely. What I hear there is there's so much invested in the work. So going right back to the Jill Ma case and talking to Tom Mar. So you've got a case... You've got a place as well, that stretch of Hume Highway, Pheasant's Nest. You've got a phenomenon, which is PTSD and the way it affects police. And now you've got a character. You've got a character named Kate Delaney. Mm. And when we first meet her, uh, she's a journalist and she's in danger. Uh, she's very cold. She's approaching the Southern Highlands in the backseat of a car without her consent. And a stranger is driving. So that's the situation in which she finds herself. Tell us more about Kate Delaney. What should we know about her? Well, she's an Irish-Australian journalist um, like me. <laughs> but she's not me per se, but she she's stolen a lot of my stories. <laughs> we share some foibles. <laughs> we both hate cross-cultural pizza. <laughs> um, <laughs> we, yeah, I mean, she has a lot of my stories, but she is quite different to me in lots of ways as well. Um, but I, the reason I wanted to make her a journalist is because I thought that a journalist as a victim would be so much more knowing, not just about the criminal justice process, but also about the media process and how this was going to play out and how, you know, she's attractive, ergo, she's gorgeous, you know, she's, she's well known, ergo, she's a celebrity. Like it's, so it's this kind of thing. And, um, and I also really liked the idea of the sort of interplay between her as a sort of strong, interesting victim and her um, aggressor who is a guy who is really quite stupid. Mm. <laughs> and I had covered a lot of Cry, like a lot of court cases um, as a court reporter back in the day and some of my beautiful court reporter colleagues are here tonight and we'll remember too that a lot of the time that people lost their lives for really, really stupid reasons. That And it was one of the things that I found really, really hard to take, that um, that a life could be snuffed out or destroyed forever by someone who was just trying to, I don't know, get a name for themselves or get back at their ex-partner or whatever the case may be, and that most criminals were not, like, diabolical masterminds. Yeah, yeah. I, I DM'd you when I was in the middle of the book because I was, like, racing through it. It really is one of those books where you feel like you've stepped off a coral reef and you've been taken by a rip, like you just need to race to the end. But when I got to the middle, I, I DM'd you and I said hey, one of the things I'm really appreciating is that this guy is not Hannibal Lecter, like a diabolical no. mastermind or a, some sociopathic practical genius like the guy in Happy Valley, as much as they're incredible villains, obviously, but that he's actually a loser and a bit of a dead shit. Yeah. And, like, I he's really a total dead that. shit. Yeah. Yeah, and she is finding him so annoying. And one of Kate's, you know, little sort of things that makes her human is she's also a bit of a snob and she, she just finds him so annoyed. She, she thinks he's a bogan, basically. Yeah. There is this dark humour that I really love in the book because I think one of the things that prevents me from reading crime is how heavy it can get. But Kate is funny. Like, this isn't a comedy per se, but, like, there are kind of, like, laugh-out-loud observations in the book. Yeah, well, I really wanted to make it the sort of book where you really got to love the characters and by the end of the book, like, you didn't want to let them go. Mm. And um, and also I, I didn't want it to be a punish. Like, I, I wanted people to have fun with it. I wanted people like me who are time-poor people with too many tabs open, you know, um, to be able to read it and, and just dive into it and enjoy it. Um, 
but also not to be patronised by it. Like yeah. I didn't want it to be pedestrian, cliched crime fiction. And, and actually I didn't write it as crime fiction. I just wrote it as the book that I wanted to write. But of course, because crime has had such a huge sort of position in my life and my journalism, of course there was going to be a crime at the centre of it. Mm. Uh, every good story needs a really good cold open. And uh, that's the case for an investigative journalism piece, how we book the reader in. And it's the case for a novel as well. And this book opens with such high stakes and you do reel us in with the character of Kate and her predicament quite quickly. Um, would you be able to read for us just to give us a bit of the setup? I've got an of early course. section at the start of the book that's just that long. Okay. And so I had, so what side am I? Yeah, start there. Oh yeah. So I haven't got my glasses. So <laughs> <laughs> I'll give it a college try. Kate Delaney was difficult to miss in a room, tall with masses of red curly hair that she usually blow dried into a 60s style. Pale skin, hazel eyes, a peppering of tiny freckles on the bridge of her nose. She liked to wear mini shift dresses in the style of Mary Quant. Tonight's was navy with a white collar with black tights to give it an edge. Huge red handbag, crocodile knee high boots, with blocky heels. She was not to every man's taste. Her teeth were, oh, I've lost my, hello. My, I'll swap. <laughs> she was not to every man's taste. Her teeth were a little gappy, her loose jointed elbows somehow awkward, her knees scarred with too many childhood scrapes. But those that did find her attractive found her devastating. And when she walked into a room, well, there she was, unmissable. And this guy did not plan on missing Kate Delaney on this night. As she ordered the drinks, she felt a tap on her shoulder. Can I buy you one of those? He asked in a voice that she instantly pitied for its nasal high pitch. Nope, fine, I'm fine, sorry, nope, I'm fine, thanks. Just here with them there, ladies, she said, grinning in her sweetest way, giving him a playful, let us have our fun wink. Huh, okay. He looked at her again with that fixed gaze, set jaw. She suspected he was a tooth grinder, insecure but pumped up. She walked back to her friends and downed several more glasses of wine. The room was getting warmer. The girls were getting funnier. Tonight's topic of conversation, why couldn't you be the person you were with the guys who really loved you, but who you didn't love all the time? Because that was the super you. What was it about going out on a date with a guy who was nice and smart, but not just quite right, but who was clearly smitten, that turned you immediately into the super you, funnier than Tina Fey? But as soon as you spent five minutes in the company of a man you were actually into, the one-liners washed out to sea. You became inarticulate as a bloody baboon. It was one of life's great tragedies. Sylvia, who's Kate's best friend, mooted that they get together and write a self-help book entitled Unleash the Super You. Only they all realised, shrieking and choking on their drinks, that they had no bloody, bloody idea how to do it. At which point Kate and Bridget decided they needed to go to the bathroom. As she got up, Kate felt that familiar warm rush to the head of a couple too many wines a not altogether unpleasant feeling, but one that signalled she should probably think about calling it a night soon. And yet she knew that she was kidding herself, that she would leave. She reapplied red lipstick in the dirty speckled mirror that was bolted onto the wall and gave herself a shake, bursting out of the toilet door with Bridget to her left. To her right, she heard the nasal voice. Nice ass, sweetheart. I'd like to get a piece of that. She felt his hand brush against it in a proprietal way. Kate felt the familiar Celtic temper flood her veins. 
She was five wines down, or was it six? And she had heard this sort of thing before. Her friends were the types to shrug and walk, not Kate Delaney. At times, her retorts had great comic effect. She'd never forget the time when, at a rave party, a sleazy guy, eeing off his dial, came up to her and asked her in a schmaltzy whisper, if you could have anything in the world right this minute, what would it be? And Kate Delaney had turned to this orange-hued man and said, anything? Right now? Okay, I wish that you'd stop going to the solarium. <laughs> she could practically see the MDMA doing a triple pike and turn it, turning its effect inside out right there in his adult brain, right there on the spot. He had looked like the sort of guy who fancied himself and his prospects with women rather highly, particularly when there were much younger, naive-looking girls at dance parties. Collateral damage. So again, on this particular September Saturday night in Northcote, she decided to resort to comedy, to unleash the super you. She circled behind him, pointed to his bottom, and shook her head, tut-tutting to Bridget, who was pressing her lips together in comically anxious anticipation. Saggy ass, love. So much for all those hours at the gym, she said as Bridget cackled. It was true. His ass was flat. Kate and Bridget then bolted over to the table, grabbed Sylvia and the other girls and their handbags and coats and shot out the door in fits of laughter, adrenaline pumping through them like soda, running down the street like schoolgirls in their mother's heels. Kate felt catapulted back into those teenage nights when you'd pour out half a bottle of Bacardi, fill it with Coke and push each other in shopping trolleys while listening to The Clash on a ghetto blaster. And that was Kate Delaney's big mistake. Louise Milligan, everyone. Cool. So I might use the handheld mic. Thank you. Um, don't you all immediately fall in love with Kate Delaney from that section? <laughs> um, by the way, Louise, you're one of the most recognisable voices in Australian media, but you have not recorded the audiobook, is that right? No, and a beautiful woman has, and an, oh, there she is. So, I mean, basically, I did my first two audiobooks for my non fiction books, and it is quite a feat. Like, you actually have to kind of act and I'm not an actor, and I was just like, I want the listener to be absolutely immersed in the book and the characters. And so I approached Sasha Haller, who is, as you all know, an absolutely incredible Australian actor, and to my absolute delight, she said yes, and she's done such a wonderful job, and I'm so glad she's here tonight. And she's also just been a really beautiful supporter um, of the book in general. And uh, could I have like a huge round of applause? Sasha Hollow, right there, everyone. For this amazing woman. Love you. <laughs> um, what's really interesting about this book is that as much as there's Kate and the guy, because we won't name him because he doesn't deserve he a name. He doesn't deserve right? a name, no. So there's the guy. But you introduce us to this entire constellation of characters. There's the partner, there's Sylvia, the best friend, but there's also all of these other characters that you give us such delicious access to. So give us an idea of at least some of them, like Liam and Sylvia especially, who are on their own mission in this book, aren't they? Yeah. So one thing that I really wanted to have in the book, so I am a migrant child, mm -hmm. um, a new Australian, and one thing that being a new Australian, you know, particularly at the time when I came to Australia, it was very, very monocultural in the school that I went to. It was kind of full of all these like little kids that looked like Beck and Leighton Hewitt, Hewitt <laughs> all singing, come on, I was like, come on. I know that, like, I don't want to trigger you, Ben. But... Oh, yeah, 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 no, I'm, I'm taken back to a very interesting place in my mind right now. Yeah. Um, but um, I felt like a complete fish out of water and I was like this like pale, like 
you know, I thought interesting kid <laughs> who read books and had frilly white socks and, mm -hmm. you know, and I, I felt very, very um, different from all the other kids. Mm -hmm. And a, as I grew older, like, I, I don't know, I, I became someone who was like really good at falling in love. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it was kind of a special talent. <laughs> Um, and I think it's because it's like that idea that when you actually meet someone who understands you, when you are a bit of an outsider, that you, you know, th there's something like incredibly magical about that. And so I really wanted that to be a feature in the book. And, and so, yeah, I, I wanted to have that in the center of the book. And of course, Liam is, you know, um, Kate's boyfriend and they're, reasonably new together and um they're you know totally in love and they're like these two nerdy kids who you know make create like faux smith songs together who have kind of um found this like really amazing connection and um yeah so that he's one of the characters and of course he is blamed because the cops think well you know, it's not going to be the one in a million plucked off the street. It's going to be someone she knows and he's kind of wrestling with that. And he is this, like, lovely guy who's a bit of a anti-hero in a way because he, he's, he's not perfect but he's, like, incredibly lovable. And then there's her best friend, Sylvia. Oh, she's who, a delight. I yeah, love her. Yeah, she's so great. And um, so she is a Filipina-Australian fashion journalist who... When um, when Liam discovers that Kate is missing and he gets the police to meet him back at his house, Sylvia's sitting there on the stoop in knee-high gold cowboy boots <laughs> and a tan boiler suit, and he's just imagining Kate just going, oh, for fuck's sake, Sylvia, <laughs> gold cowboy boots to a police incident, what are you doing? <laughs> um, and, yeah, she's partially to some extent based on my best friend Karen who was in fashion for a long time but she's also like a whole character on her own um I mean there's and she also brings a lot of levity to the book and one of the things you know as I said I really didn't want it to be this like dirge punish thing so there's a moment in the book which is like a key sort of moment um at the police station and um Liam and Sylvia are hearing this like terrible news and then Sylvia puts her head on the desk and she's like sobbing and <laughs> Liam notices <laughs> and one of the sleeves is across the desk <laughs> because fashion <laughs> um, so yeah so there's her as well yeah I mean you introduce us to a lot of the characters but what I also found really interesting is that you give us their point of view as well so even if it's just for the briefest moment for some of them but for all of them um you do give us access at some key points and i found like the access to police perspective really really interesting mm. you mentioned before that you um that you've worked alongside um police officers current and retired in um and detectives with those sections of the book what was it about the police experience that you wanted to portray that might be surprising to those of us who have thankfully never had much contact with the police? Well, I think that police do a job that most of the rest of us can't even begin to imagine. And I think a lot of the time they get a bit of a bad rap um, because of, you know, things that they deserve to be called to account for. But what I have seen through getting to know many, many police over many years that I, I didn't want them to be cardboard cut, cutouts. I didn't want them to be cliches. Mm. I wanted them to be flawed but also, you know, lovable characters. Mm. And was there stuff about the police investigation process? Because you know, you know the media, you know, you know Kate's world, but was there stuff about the actual process of how crimes are investigated that you want, wanted the reader to know? Yeah, I mean, I did talk to some current and former detectives about, you know, certain aspects just to make sure that I didn't get things diabolically wrong. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I will say that the, the book is not about a police investigation. It's, it's not like for people who think, oh, I'm going to get a, you know, who done it with a twist. You know, it's, it's not, that's not the main thing. It's about these characters and how they cope 
with this situation. Yeah. Um, were there touchstones for what you wanted to write? Because as you said at the start, it was like not your intention to go out there and write a crime or a thriller. You wanted to write the book that you wanted to write. But were there some reference points in mind where you're just like, if I got the chance, it would be that kind of book? Or was it a rejection of like certain types of books that you wanted to do? I, I honestly, like I, I really, it, the whole thing was just a happy accident. Like I didn't, I didn't at all have any particular plan or, you know, it was just like, this is what wrote itself. You cannot tell other authors that. They're going to be so, so pissed off. <laughs> Sorry, like, this other is just, authors. It happened by accident. <laughs> no, no, but it really did. And I mean, like, yeah, I mean, I, I wouldn't lie then. <laughs> um, no, it, it, like it, it just sort of came out of me. And, mm. you know, it started like when I came back to it many years later, I had COVID and I wrote six chapters in a week um, in my COVID bed. And then I was just at a gallop, you know, and then these people were like living in my head and I was like, oh, that's what Liam would do next. That's what Kate would do next. You know? I mean, that is so admirable. But again, a lot of other people are going to be annoyed. Like when we all had COVID, we were not writing a novel, but we are not with these I know it sounds all terribly A-type personality of me, but it's, it's actually not. Like it was just something that I really wanted to do yeah. and I had so much fun doing it. And it was like in all seriousness, it was huge therapy for me because I was in a really dark place at the time. Mm. I needed to do it. I needed to have an outlet. Um, yeah. It's interesting to hear you talk about like the writing process as therapeutic because often when people write nonfiction, especially memoirs, that's the question they're asked. Was it therapeutic for you? And I'm interested in how like writing fiction is therapeutic and, and like how did it change you? Like who who were you before writing this book and how did it transform you in the process of it? I remember that there was someone that I was dealing with quite a bit for work at the time. Um because I was in a, you know, I was in a, a bit of a dark place and she would say to me every single time you um, you talk about that book, your whole face changes, you know. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I, it, just, it just had to be. Like, mm. I, I can't find a pithy way of saying it. It just is what it is and... I had waded through a lot of misery, like, in the stories. And then I'd been subjected to this, like, ridiculous campaign from these stupid culture warriors who just would not stop. And um, I just needed to have something outside of that. Um, and this was the perfect thing. Mm. So a book about someone in danger kind of becomes for you a point of safe yeah. harbour. So a book about you know, kidnapping <laughs> and sexual assault. and <laughs> Yeah, it became this beautiful thing for me. No, well, I, I, I've got a theory, right, um, which is that if you are a storyteller in any way, shape or form, you have muscles that you can apply to other forms of storytelling. Mm. And you've been working in investigative journalism and, and book writing for quite some time, but within the non-fiction realm. How did that work help you do this? I've got a lot of yarns, Ben, a lot of yarns. Um, and just, yeah, so much observation of people and characters. Um, yeah, I felt like I was like a magpie, just yeah. collecting things and, you know, going to the sort of bottom drawer of observations and... Yeah, there's just so much there over, you know, I've been a journalist for 24 years um, and, I, and I'd always wanted to write a novel as much of a journalistic cliche as I admit <laughs> that is. I had always wanted to write a novel um, since I was a little kid, like mm. long before I wanted to be a journalist. And my mum always said that I would. And, I, you know, just life got in the way, journalism got in the way, you know, and... Um, I sort of came to it in a roundabout way. And when I was writing my nonfiction, I wanted to write that in a quite literary way. Like mm. I didn't write that in a, you know, that very sort of factual sort of way that a lot of um, nonfiction is written. So 
um, yeah, I guess it was sort of inevitable that it would eventually happen. So when you're talking about magpieing, when you're talking about bow birding, like are there ever things that you encounter in journalism that for legal reasons, for reasons of balance, fairness and objectivity, where you're like, I can't use this, but yes. I know just the place I can put it. <laughs> I could tell you, but I'd have to kill you. <laughs> Okay, look, I'm going to throw it open to the audience soon. We sure. are going to take some audience questions, but um, I've got a few rapid-fire questions about this book that um, I'm interested in. Like, did you have rules or commandments when writing this book? Like, thou shalt, thou shalt not, this is what I want to do, this is what I don't want to do? Well, just trying to be, like, to have word economy, I suppose, like not making it too frilly, um, you know, the same sort of discipline that I apply to journalism and... Unfortunately, Sally Neighbour's not here tonight, um, but Morag is. I haven't even said hello to you yet. <laughs> but, yeah, those two women taking out the whip to my Four Corners scripts over many years. Like, so I you heard their voices in your head. I can just always picture Sally going, but what's the through line? <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and Morag would just always come out with these, like, just ways of getting around things and whatever. And it, it did make me disciplined, actually. Like, um, so, yeah, and because people were saying to me, oh, it's this beautifully structured book. And I was like, oh, I don't know how that happened. <laughs> <laughs> it must be Sally and Morag. <laughs> <laughs> what was easy and what was most difficult about writing this? Nothing was difficult. Really? Nothing wow. at all. It was all pure joy. Um, and what was easy? Everything. Because <laughs> I just loved it. I loved it. I loved every single minute of it. And, you know, I'm writing another one now, although I've had to have a bit of a pause because, again, the small matter of Cranbrook came along oh, and yes. took over my life for a few months. So, yeah. <laughs> Okay, so good tip for anyone who finds fiction writing hard. Be one of the country's best investigative journalists for decades and then you'll find it very easy. <laughs> Also, I think, like, you know, give all I did was, like, kind of give up TV for a while. Like, okay. I stopped watching, you know, Netflix shows and I obviously didn't read. Things you want people feel inspired by Kate Delaney's refusal to be a victim but to be a survivor because the epidemic of violence against women in this country and elsewhere has got to stop. And I just wanted to lift up, you know, a person at the centre of this. And the perpetrator is nothing and the victim is everything. Yeah, right on. Hey, Louise, my final theory, um, this might sound a little bit strange, but I think you are the Beyonce of Australian storytelling at the moment. And the reason why is I don't like, think you're ready for this, Kelly. <laughs> The reason why is Beyonce's got a new album, Cowboy Carter, out, and a lot of people are saying um, a lot of people are going to come to Beyonce who love country who didn't think they were Beyonce fans, and a lot of people are going to come to country who didn't think they love country, but they're Beyonce fans. And I think with this book, a lot of people are going to be turning to a genre they've not necessarily read before, and a lot of people are going to be coming to you because they're fans of your work, and I think that's a massive achievement oh i love you for that thank you i never thought of myself as the beyonce of anything but <laughs> there's always a first someone get her a cowboy hat um <laughs> thank you so much louise uh let's take some audience questions i think there may be a roving mic yes there's one there so don't be shy because we are not <laughs> we Ooh, are hello, not abc shy. staff member hello hello i think you both have a question What's your name? Please introduce yourself. Um, my name is Wayne and Louise. Uh, I'm graduating on the fall. So, um, my first question is um, considering ABC has such a strict policy on social media and stuff, um, what, uh, how do you convince them to let you write a question? <laughs> Sorry, I didn't hear the very end of that. Um, how do you convince them to let you do a friction as also like one of the top investigative journalists? Okay, so the question is, ABC has such kind of like rigorous standards with what you can and can't do as a journalist for the ABC. How did you convince 
the national broadcast and the national public broadcaster to let you write fiction? Well, it's a well-trodden path. Uh, there are a few ABC journalists, including Michael Brissenden, who was at Four Corners before me, who has written crime fiction, but also because I'm just making stuff up. Right? <laughs> what could possibly go wrong? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much for your question, Wing. Is there another question? Where's the mic? Is this... Sorry. Over this there. lady over here? Was oh, it? was there a question over here? No. Oh. No, just uh, enthusiastic. Oh, there's over a, there's here. a question in the centre table um, facing us. Thank you. Thanks, Louise. Thanks, Dan. Really enjoyed the chat. Does this question actually about the law book or about Louise's other work? You can ask whatever you like. Okay. I, mean, I might not answer it. But... <laughs> okay. I'll give it a shot. So I've really loved your work over the years, and um, I, I'm not surprised that you would have been drowning in misery a few years ago. How, with the, with the, with the absolute injustice that we've seen in this country, and particularly in a lot of those stories that we're discussing, how do you actually get over that? Um, I, I find it really hard, and I imagine like digesting all of those that information that you have, and then trying to have, is this book a purge? Is that do you think? In a way, it is. I mean, one of the things that I've always been struck by, I've now spoken to hundreds of survivors of sexual crimes through my work, both through, you know, my work for the ABC, but also through meeting people through my books. And so often what they say to me is the thing that got them in the end was not the terrible things that happened to them as a child or, you know, an adult survivor, but the institutional betrayal and the poor way in which things were handled. And I have to say, you know, from a sort of a secondary point of view, that's the thing that has really struck me as well. You know, you, you, you kind of think that, the right thing will happen when things are exposed, but that doesn't always happen. And it's that stuff that um, becomes very difficult. And it's also when you, and also when you as the messenger are shot in a way that I would say is very gendered as well. Um, and you just, yeah. I guess, I mean, what do you do? I don't know. You just kind of put one foot in front of the other and keep ploughing on because the work is important. Like, exposing this stuff is really important. And I come from generations of bloody-minded Irish Catholic women who refuse to be beaten, so I'm not going to be beaten either. Mm. Thank you for your question. Oh, I think Sasha might have. Oh, no, Amber has a question. Oh, oh no, Kim has a question. <laughs> oh, so one of my really good friends in Melbourne is Laurie Zion, who you may know invented the Hottest 100, and he's such a beautiful man, and he's like, you've got to create the playlist because it's sort of, it's, it's a soundtrack to, you know, my, at into Kate Delaney and Liam Carroll. So there's the Stone Roses, there's the Church, <laughs> there's the Cure, there's the Smiths, you know, all, all of the, unfortunately the Smiths and the Stone Roses have kind of gone a bit wacko in recent years, but, um, <laughs> but um, yeah, so, yeah, I mean, the other thing was that I wrote it in a very visual way and in a delightful development, like there are lots of um, production companies who've been sort of showing some interest. Ooh, okay, adaptation um, possibly in the works. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, yeah, I, yeah. I, I might just put up a Spotify list. I'll, I'll get on to that. <laughs> you might be an author and a music supervisor soon for television. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for your question. Um, Where's the mic now? Are oh, there some questions? Oh, here? Over here? Jenny. Dan's doing the, the rounds. Um, Louise, did you have 
a one or two, a two or two, a ten or two, and it's a mixed book. It's just what you <laughs> I have got a two book deal. Yeah. Um, and I am writing the second one, and yeah, there are some uh, connections. <laughs> Same cinematic universe. Uh, it's it's very different in lots of ways, uh-huh. but um, as my protagonist is Irish Australian, this one a lot of it will be set in Ireland. Ah, oh, good question. Very good question. An Irish question. <laughs> Um, as a fellow librarian, I'm drawn to writing fiction. And why are we so bloody good at it? <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like a Dorothy Dixon friend. <laughs> um, I, I mean, it's in our bones, right? It's in our culture. Like, I mean, my mum has 10 brothers and sisters, and, you know, from when I was a very small child, you know, part of the evenings together would be about storytelling and singing.